Hello, I'm Patrick Davidson. Welcome to Recaps. For Ventura City's 150th anniversary, Caps produced a series of interview programs with local historians and storytellers titled Ventura Legacies. On this edition of Recaps, we're sharing another of these engaging personal stories exploring Ventura's fascinating history. This edition of Recaps is hosted by Suze Montgomery. Her guests are Millie Schofield and Philip Foster Ranger, sharing personal stories about the Foster family, exploring Ventura's fascinating past. Hi, welcome to Ventura Legacies. It's our project for the 150th birthday of the city of Ventura here at Caps Media. With me today, I've got the Foster family, which is probably the most recognizable name in the city of Ventura for, as far as historical families. And I've got next to me, Phil Ranger and Melly Schofield, who are direct descendants from E.P. Foster in the family. So let's start. Millie, what do you, you're probably the most conversant on family history, right? Well, yes. You can jump in, Phil. I'm, I'm the eldest. <laughs> he, he probably has some particular knowledge about the house and the trees. I have sort of the some of the dates, important dates written down. When we were off camera, we were talking about how the family first yes. got here, and you yes. said that was in... The EP came down in 1871. He'd been living in uh, Goleta with his family, and he bought some property in the Santa Clara Valley. I'm not sure where that is today. I think it's somewhere between Ventura and Fillmore. Okay. It's flat land, I believe. He went to a May Day picnic, May 1874, and met Orpha Woods, who come to Ventura a couple of years ahead of that with her sister, who was a teacher. And they met at a picnic, and they instantly were smitten with each other. Within four months, they were married and moved to the Conejo to raise sheep. E.P. had evidently invested all he had at that time to be a sheep farmer in the Conejo. Was he a farmer before? He was raised with a ranching family, and then he learned the agriculture, horticultural business, nursery business from his in-laws okay. in Goleta. Well, they, so, brought, yeah, they brought 200 head of cattle out here. Okay. When they came in the gold during the, came, after the gold, gold rush. E.P. and his new wife, Orpha, settled on the Edwards Ranch in the Conejo and raised sheep. Their first child, Orpha Pearlie Foster, was born. And I was told by a lady who was researching the history of the Conejo that she was very likely the first Anglo child to be born on the Conejo. That's amazing mm -hmm. in itself. Mm -hmm. Evidently, Orpha, Mrs. E.P. Foster, did a lot of cooking for the ranch hands and travelers that came by. If you think about it, in those days, you'd have to take the team up that hill. Sure. And it was a great place to rest the team. And then they got to know a lot of the early ranchers that way. But unfortunately, there was a terrible drought. We've heard the term drought before. Mm. The drought of 1866-1867 totally wiped E.P. and Orpha out. Oh my God. All, and I, I have a letter from my aunt saying, can you imagine listening to bleeding sheep that were starving and, and dying oh. of thirst? And it would be just a horrible thing to go through. Two solid years of terrible drought and winds. And they lost everything. They, they lost had. everything. And something I had just read and been reminded of was poor EP, when he realized he was wiped out, he had to walk to vent all the way to Ventura and go to the uh, water company and ask for a job as a ditch tender. No was, kidding. Yeah. Because it, he, he was lost wiped all out. his He lost skills. everything. He lost everything. And walking here? He had to walk here. He eventually was able to live, bring the family down, but he couldn't pay the person who drove the family down for a couple of weeks and brought the family with him to a little house at the water company. And then he had to work very hard to come back from that loss. And his wife, Orpha, tended the company books. But that did get them back on their feet. And then things progressed from there. So they settled in Ventura. They settled back on the avenue. Mm -hmm. well, okay, so the avenue again where the town began. I think that's where the water company was. Very interesting. So they had by this time how many kids? So the second child was born about the time they were settled in on the, uh, at the water company house. Uh, and if you and I'm looking at all these dates, if you were happily married, it appears you have a child every one to two years. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, no birth control. That makes Unfortunately, sense. <laughs> they lost half of their infants uh, within six to seven months of birth. Most of the, all of the boy children pa passed on from. I don't know if it's Disease? they were just frail. Well, remember frail? we had pneumonia, we had uh, flus and uh, uh, influenzas, but it sounds like that. Um, 
they just were not strong infants. And they, they died at six months, four months. That's How awful. Interesting. That's an awful well, loss. Well, we had no medications. There was no, no antibiotics. Mm -hmm. There was no modern day medicine. So they no bottles for nothing. nursing babies. Nothing. 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 Little Jean at seven and a half. Yes, their one son lived to be seven and a half. And then so he, he died survived. of pneumonia only to seven and a half. Wow. So it was a very much a heartbreak. So was Orpha Pearly was her name? Orpha Pearl is the firstborn daughter. And she, she survived. She survived. All the daughters survived. Uh, to well, why did I tell you something? Though? Yes. Strong. Well, <laughs> oh. actually, it's a it's a medical fact that female infants are stronger than male infants. It is, I just it is a I never do that. It is a medical fact. Okay. She's a registered nurse. She <laughs> Not for many years. <laughs> I just remember really? that fact. Yeah. Interesting. Uh -huh. EP didn't let that stop him because he was very hardworking and there were opportunities that uh, became evident while he was working on the flume at, at the Ventura River. He was using 200 acres at the James, is it James Day Ranch? Yeah. Day ranch. ranch, you know where they have that strawberry stand yes, from time to time? Right, that is right. the old Day Ranch. And that is where E.B. Foster utilized 200 acres and planted apricot trees. And after a number of years, those apricot trees became a very good cash crop. And he also sublet the land in between the trees to a Chinese gentleman who grew uh, vegetables and other fruits, I guess. And you know, so he- That's interesting you say that about the apricot. Seems to be that apricots and walnuts were the big cash crops mm -hmm. out here and for then a lima long beans. time. And then lima beans. And, and then strawberries. Strawberries. And they also had pinto beans mm -hmm. out here. I mean, the different crops that they've rotated through mm -hmm. And that's interesting Those that it, the old ways. Yeah, mm -hmm. but that's what's sold. But I, I'm thinking lima beans. I mean, who eats lima beans? Do you know that the Fosters used to grow lima beans on their property? I mean, I learned at Pearl's table to like lima beans. This was Pearl. She was she was plain. This is her about I would say in her fifties. Wow, and this she was is younger. Good for this, this is younger than I ever knew her. This is her with my mother and father. So she great in her fifties inherited teenagers. And all that entailed. And she was single. And she, she had well, she was single and she was looking after her mother and father in a big house. And kids. And these children. She had to be tough. She, uh, it was difficult. My father tells us that she felt that he needed uh, an education, a good education and discipline. So she sent him right away to the Harvard Military Academy in Los Angeles. But she would drive him down every uh, Monday and pick him up every Saturday. She was a no-nonsense girl. She was yeah. determined. And uh, as a youngster on the avenue in the, in the foster house, I remember her and her live-in. Yes, Rose, housekeeper. Uh, as very strict. As a little kid, you, you could not have much fun around them. Well, you know? they keep were pretty in mind, strict. there were three of us ranger siblings, and I'm sure we clobbered up the stairs and were yeah. oh, making a racket and fighting and doing all those bad things. Uh, uh, wow, she must, I, I just can imagine. Mm -hmm. it, you know, that was the only way she could control. Well, she did her best. And actually, they, uh, both my father and his sister, Carolyn, became very, very fond of her. So where does EP come into this picture? Because the EP Library, Foster Park, everything uh, means Seaside Park, which we were talking about, which is now mm -hmm. the fairgrounds. This was significant property uh, mm -hmm. that was owned by the family. Well, let's go back to the uh, apricot orchard because okay. that was the start of his fortune. What he did was- He took the funds from the apricots Yes. And invested it in the And he bank. bought $10,000 worth of stock in the Bank of Ventura. It was organized by Thomas Bard, and he became cashier and later president. And then what happened there was the Bank of Italy bought it out, and I believe that's when Grandpa Foster retired from that position. But at the same time, he was doing agricultural endeavors, and he was uh, selling real estate. This he invested must have been in something else. Well, something he was else. here early. He could see the land's to purchase, I mean, there were, he was a pioneer. He was here early with well, tough with stock. The, the Sexton family that were very good friends of theirs, when EP's dad, they settled into Half Moon Bay and then came down to Goleta. They lived next door to the Sextons who were nurserymen. So he learned all about nursery, nurse, being a nurseryman and, and planning. And grafting propagating and trees. propagating. I read all that and I was fascinated mm -hmm. because he must have had an inquisitive mind. He educated himself. He went to a very small school in Half Moon Bay 
three pupils. And then after primary education, I believe he did most of his studying and educated himself at night. He was bright and hardworking. Orpha, on the other hand, was very well educated for the times. She had attended college and a commercial school, and I believe she could have been a teacher or a principal. That and, was very unusual. Yeah, for very that unusual time. for that day. So they were both very well mm -hmm. educated and, and hardworking. And hardworking. I think that's the bottom line: is the mm -hmm. hardworking part. So they were very industrious mm -hmm. and probably instilled in that into the family. I mean, you got. If you think about it, I, uh, Aunt Pearl, you'll, you'll remember this. We'd come to visit her on Sundays, and she was always knitting or tatting or doing some handiwork. She was, her hands never were still. never still. They had all these losses from their family, you know, babies dying. But, hardships. but life hardships, but there were wonderful advantages to being the, the early folks here too. But this is something my brother can speak to is, if you think about the early days of Ventura, and I've seen this written down, it really was a very barren place. It really is kind of high desert. There were no trees to speak of other than scrub oak, manzanita, mustard. Oh, <laughs> mustard, yeah. yeah. So really, there weren't many trees, and that's why uh, EP, trees were very important at the time. They planted trees for shade. Well, to shade yeah. and to block the wind at the mm -hmm. fairgrounds, when he purchased the land at the fairgrounds, he wanted, he wanted the community to be able to come out and enjoy, especially the young people, to family. enjoy family. Mm -hmm. So he planted trees all along the beach before the fairgrounds was the fairgrounds. To mitigate they, the fog. They cut hundreds of trees down when it was the fairgrounds. Mm -hmm to get rid of them, but he planted all these trees. And, and I recall um, in, in junior high school, at Anacapa Junior High in eighth grade when I started surfing, and we would walk up from California Street surf spot there up to the fairgrounds, and you'd look at Hobo Jungle, which he planted all those trees there. When we walked into Hobo Jungle, just 25, 50 feet off the, the beach, the water, it was scary and dark. The canopy of trees let up. very little light that's through. Really? And that's why it was called Hobo Jungle. And the hobos would come down the line and get off in Ventura. They'd spend a few days there and they'd be camping or whatever they do in, in Hobo Jungle. But it was a fearful place for us young surf rats. He also envisioned the whole chain of the older county parks. And when he and Orpha were taking a picnic to what is now Camp Comfort, when the owner, uh, Mr. Capey Grant, was logging some of the fine old oak trees there, and he thought that was a travesty because we needed to save trees. So he convinced Mr. Grant to stop logging. He put up 5,000 of his own, uh, his and Orpha's own money, convinced the county to do the same, to buy the land, and that was the first county park, is Camp Comfort. That was a lot of money for those mm -hmm. days. It was. It was, that was times a 10. Thinking about when he first, he lost everything and started all over again. This guy is tough. He, but he did well. <laughs> and, then, and then he gave it all away. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then he, he gave every everything away. He gave all the land to the, the county. The community became his heirs. And he was also very influenced by reading the Andrew Carnegie book about oh. libraries. That was a pivotal that moment. Was, okay, that was his epiphany when he, mm -hmm. because Carnegie, that's what he did. He also came up scrappy also mm -hmm. started with nothing. Came back to dynasty. Nothing. Mm -hmm. He actually was pretty well to do, I believe, in Goleta because he'd bought some land there, came to Ventura and bought some land, so he was not without to start with. It's just that he lost everything in his first big venture as a married man, and that was devastating. That was devastating. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine how she would feel as well? Mm -hmm. I'm sure she was frightened. Petrified, and then losing the children. Uh, I mean, they had a lot of hardship in their they lives. Did. They but did. he pursued and he mm -hmm. shouldered on. Mm -hmm. It's, it's really amazing to me when I think about these early pioneer families like this, like yours and other ones like Dudley's. I mean, what they persevered. Why? What drove them to the point of not just throwing their hands in the air and walking away and nuts to this, I'm not going to do this. But there's something deep inside that drives them. Well, they also had a strong sense of community. They knew their other farmers, and they were all they all very close because of adversity and and the, and the elements working against them. They had clubs. They got together. There was a Tuesday really? club. They had poetry readings when the Foster Bowl was created. They had Shakespearean plays at the park, and they would dam up the creek 
in Foster Park and have uh, and go tenting for a week in the summertime. Now, how uh, was Foster community. Park created? Do you have any idea? The, it was created in memory of their son, Eugene, whom we spoke of earlier, who right, did survive that. to be okay. almost seven. And they were the, evidently, from what I read from um, my aunt letter, they never really recovered from that loss because this is their one boy and he survived frail, but he survived until seven and then had a terrible case of pneumonia and passed away. And it, it, it broke their hearts. So that's when they, uh, this is after they had bought the, uh, helped purchase Camp Comfort. Then in 1910, they envisioned and donated the Eugene C. Foster Memorial Park there were some other families involved the EP convinced to donate the land. It's such an unusual mm -hmm. place. I mean, mm -hmm. I recently went up there and I was just fascinated because it's this granite bowl and I mean, it's mm -hmm. overgrown with weeds mm -hmm. and everything, but you could see at one time this was like an amazing place. Mm -hmm. It's a beautiful spot. I do feel one day when we're more urbanized, even than now, that these old parks will somehow become more precious. I than think you're they right. are right now. I think they are. There too. are like 24 species of birds in in the Foster Park area. Really? Where did you both grow up in town? Well, <laughs> our parents. Lots of places. Post, post World <laughs> War II, my father came back um, and didn't have a lot of money, and so um, I think at one point he was mowing lawns. They had a lot of rental houses okay. until we were about the age of 13, and then they bought the Johnson home at the top of Glen Ellen Drive, and that's when I have the most memories uh, from the age of 13 well, we to were 20. In, we were in Martha Schreiber's. Yes, they built a house yeah. and and um, lost money on it, so they left that. We went from Glen, Upper Glen Allen to Pomona and Palomares, yeah. and then back up to the very dead end of Glen Allen, and our family was there for 40 years. Yeah. Wow. Right next to John Earl Taft on one side, and the hotels Don Woolsey be, yeah. and the hotels on the other side, so we had some very wonderful, names. wonderful great names friends. too. Yeah. Awesome. Doctor, Doctor mm -hmm. Moore was right. These are all mm -hmm. big, mm -hmm. recognizable kick, names. Kicked the can uh, yeah. all summer long mm -hmm. with all the neighborhood idyllic kids. Idyllic children. It was great. It was idyllic. We had uh, wonderful parents and um, and wonderful extended family. You know, Pearl Foster represented. She uh, she always seemed like an elegant, patient, loving woman to me, and she really was more like a grandmother to me. I felt she was like my grandmother. Did she my share with you stories? Did she would from time to time. She would bring things up. She'll, she would say, for instance, oh, you know, Father gave those trees to the mission, mm -hmm. which I didn't, I didn't remember. You mean those two big trees? Two big star pines. Two big star pines. Mm -hmm. He planted those. Uh, yeah. One of the Padres asked EP, really? you know, walking downtown, and said, you know, we would like to have some big trees in the garden near the mission. They're beautiful. Well, they're probably a hundred and some years old. Oh yeah, yeah. at least. Mm -hmm. Now, how did the Foster Library come to be? I mean, this is our only library. Well, we have one small one on De Anza. Well, it was City Hall and library simultaneously. Yes. Oh, at the same time? Yes. yes. Okay. They purchased, in 1921, E.P. and Orpha purchased the Shepherd Gardens and build the library city hall and present it to the city. The Andrew Carnegie book was probably the inspiration of that. A, 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 the, the Fosters were always interested in helping children, young people, uh, achieve their potential. They, um, the Big Sisters uh, Orphanage was right next to their home on the avenue, and they would bring those children in and have picnics and feed them meals and play. They would play on the beautiful grounds of the house. Um, so anyway, in 1921, and EP did a lot of the cement work uh, at the library. He created a, um, a bird bath there, and he did a little pond in cement, and he did this really? at the house too. He loved working with cement. Mm -hmm. So now, like for example, the, when you were talking about the house on the avenue, this is the one that burned down. Burned down. Mm -hmm. That was vandalism, if I don't know, right? Actually, it turns out, you probably know this better than me, but weren't, wasn't there gas left in the pipes? The gas had never been fully shut oh, no. off. Right, but unfortunately there had, been, there had been vagrants in the property for many years. Okay. Understood that. They needed a place to- Yeah, shelter. You know, to shelter, but when the gangs began to go in. And we knew there were gangs because I had photographed the monikers all over the interior of the, of the house. Oh my God. The built-ins, the beautiful, beautiful built-ins oh. and doors and mirrors were blatantly 
vandalized. It was very sad. And fires had been started on the floor. They start fires on the floor to heat up their drugs or whatever. And so we did the best we could. We tried to warn school district about it, but unfortunately- We were just the school district owned the property at the time? School district, Mm -hmm. the property was given to the school district because EP and Orpha kind of started the school district. That must be another story. Okay, how did they start the school district? EP served on the Ventura High Board, but I think you're talking about the early days on the Avenue. The Avenue School, EP- I think they helped build the the, the first little school there. Was the Avenue School. Okay, and then later down the street was well, E.P. That Foster. Was, that, that was named, later. That, that was named. That was named after him. Okay, but, but that looks he, like it's been there for a while too. It right? has. But he started the first Avenue School. That mm-hmm. was the very first school. And I'm sure he had something to do with the huge ficus that's in the grounds of that school. I'm sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but there's an interesting thing here we should tell you about Pearl, Orpha Pearl, their firstborn, and who was like our grandmother, decided that uh, she was getting elderly and she. Couldn't, she hasn't, hadn't driven for 15 years. And so she decided to try and sell the, the family home because it was too expensive to live there and too impractical. And she was nothing if not practical. So she put the house on the market and it didn't sell. So she ended up donating it to the school district to take a tax write-off. But at the time she moved out, you'll remember this, we drove up one last time to see the old house mm. and they were carting away the huge ancient magnolia tree from the wonderful <gasps> garden. And another big tree, I can't even remember what that was. They uprooted the they, tree? They did, they took it to Disneyland. <laughs> They'd How did it get sunk. to Disneyland? Disneyland was being built in 55. That's right. So oh, we, we never figured out where our, our family trees went, but the big trees were carted off and we saw them being carted off How in 1955. Well, I'm sure she was looking for ways to make money because remember, and AP. Disneyland bought it? Dis- whoever was the landscapers of Disneyland or Disney Park came and, and were scouting around for mature trees to put around the park. That is really unusual. <laughs> yeah. That's a great factoid. Mm-hmm. It was a magnificent property. As mm-hmm. kids, there were multiple fruit trees of every kind, mm-hmm. bamboo forests. Two big fish ponds. Big fish ponds. You must with have fish. Had a it ball. was as a two to eight year old, it was, it was heaven. unbelievable mm-hmm. to run around. It was like a mini plant, California plantation. So it breaks your heart when you oh. see the devastation mm-hmm. that happened to of this course. house. Well, it was a different era, you know. Yeah. It, uh, you know but uh, still, we, you know, no mm-hmm. respect for mm-hmm. history mm-hmm. or... Oh. We had just started trying to put together a, a, a E.P. Foster Home Preservation Society, and then that month, the house burned down. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But as someone else said, that doesn't mean you can't Create you can still a building it. of honor, uh, some some way to honor them there. Society. But of course, it is it does belong to the school district. So that's a that's another topic for another day. Let's talk about the fairgrounds, okay? Because the fairgrounds fascinate me. How that ever and that's such a amazing piece of property, mm-hmm. and it's so valuable, and mm-hmm. it's part of the history. Mm-hmm. And I've looked at all the old. Well, there was. But it was, it, was given, it was given for the good of all, and it was not actually given originally to be the fairgrounds. It was given to be a gateway park, and that's okay. what was envisioned. Later on in the, was it the late 50s, early 60s, the family were convinced to sign a quick claim so that they could turn it to the state for state building improvements. What, now, how did that happen? How did they, how were they convinced? We weren't there, so we don't know, but we've heard rumors that there was undue pressure, that there was a lot of pressure. God. And maybe even money under the table to one relative. That's your but family's inheritance. Well, no, no, no. Think of it no. this way, Susie. It is the people's inheritance. There were originally uh, horseback riding, trails, hiking trails, tennis courts. A racetrack. A racetrack. He was on the fair board and he was he loved the fairs. And he actually, I have a picture of him in the fair parades. So he's riding a white, he, have, he may have one of Mr. Camarillo's Oh, that's horses. one of the Camarillo horses. It could be. But it that's sure EB. looks like one, doesn't it? Yeah. Oh, very distinguished. Yes. I love distinguished. the bowler hat. I think that was probably in his 70s. EP was on the board of the Bard Hospital. There was this group called the Big Sisters. They, they looked after women, I think, that were in trouble and the orphanage and maybe other good deeds. I'm, I'm really not clear on the Big Sisters and who they all were. I just know that Orpha and her sisters were a part of the Big Sisters. Uh-huh. And this was Depression-era 
raising funds in the Depression era. They were trying to get enough funds to build a new hospital in the present location of Community Memorial. The sisters were working very hard and they came to their father when they, they needed help for the last push to get the funds completed, the fund drive completed. And EP ended up putting in about $50,000 of funds and wow. stocks, which at that in today's money, that would be like six, $650,000, something like that, during the Depression. So they completed their fund drive and the hospital went forward. And then I think Orf, Mother Orpha was on the new hospital board and Orpha Pearl, I believe, took her place after she, she got did. frail. Mm -hmm. And then after EP died in 1932, they named it Foster Memorial. And, and here's where Orpha, I'm so proud of Orpha Pearl. For 50 years, she served on that board. 20, wow. 25 years as president. And it's only when her hearing was failing that she had to resign as president of the board, but she stayed on until age 95. Oh, she and then was retired. Tough. She was. No she loved, you guys she loved the up. hospital. And oddly enough, a few years after EP had completed the fund drive, they came back to Mother Orpha and said, we need some more operating funds. And she had to give another $20,000 a few years after that time. So. <laughs> but you know, the legacy lives on. Mm -hmm. I mean, Foster is probably the most revered name in this town as far as ancestral history. I mean, it's everywhere. And I mean, okay. uh -huh. you gotta be proud when you're driving by. I'm you, gotta, you gotta think about mm -hmm. this. I mean, you got and stop and think, and I hope you've taught all your kids and it pass this knowledge down in this rich fabric of history to the kids so they know who they are. We need to do our oral histories before we toddle on into this. More I think oil. you need to do yeah. it. Yeah. Well, you but, know who had a great idea? It was Sarah Calvin had a great idea. We wanted, and we actually approached Kevin Costner through Tim Hopter. Yeah, Timmy. It was an idea. We wanted to do a documentary of E.P. Foster and, Orpha. And, and, and Orpha and tell that story, and he would have the wherewithal to really do yes, it. Yes, right? he could. Yes, he could. And I, we don't think it ever got to him, I think. Uh, He's a busy man. Uh, but I will say... Would have been a great, oh, great wow. one. Everything EP did, she was a part of. They consulted. Exactly. They worked together. They were a team. Frequently people the will old, say EP Foster. Uh, yeah, the pioneer people, the EP old, Orpha. you know, our old people, they all did that. Did mm -hmm. they, you know, it wasn't like I was saying to Bob Dudley that was on previously and he was in his 90s. I said, he says, what happened to people? He goes, what's with these the people getting divorced here and there? They're married a couple years, they get divorced. What's with all this? And I <laughs> sat there and I go, well, it's too easy. Nobody wants to work at it anymore. It's easy to walk away. It's hard to stick it out. Be, a fight is not the end of the world. Mm -mm. That just means you got to iron out some stuff and you get it talked out. You move on. You don't get divorced over an empty ashtray or an empty waste basket. Exactly. You deal with it. <clears throat> and that's why I think our generation, you know, that's We don't why work hard enough for things. Everything's we, too easy. We're sticking it out, kid. Mm -hmm. Hell or high water. We're going to mm -hmm. stick it out. And I hope, to God, somebody gets that before it's too late. A lot of generation. I don't know. I worry about the millennials. I hope it doesn't take another <laughs> world war to do that. Yeah. No, it doesn't look like we're in great shape, but uh, mm -hmm. hopefully this situation works out one way or another place. Huh? <laughs> thanks for being here with us. Uh, gosh, guys, thanks. Thank you. You're welcome. I think maybe we should do something with StoryCorps with you guys. So <laughs> you're on the list for that one. <laughs> Come back and join us again. And thanks to CAPS Media TV for doing our living and our Ventura legacies. Uh -huh.